Thank you very much, Ben, for your introduction. Uh, it's always great to see your former students uh, flourishing and in positions of responsibility. It's great to see Ben here. It's my first time here in Houston. Thank you for your, for your welcome. I enjoyed the weather this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, it, it made me feel at home. I mean, it, it does that all the time in England. So uh, thanks for putting that on. Uh, and uh, it's a great privilege for me to uh, open this conference uh, tonight and to, to, to meet you. Um, I have passed, uh, there's been uh, a handout passed around and that will give you the sort of the bare bones of, of the lecture. Uh, if you haven't got one, um, I hope somebody near you will have one. This lecture is about gifts, so please share your possessions uh, with one another. And um, I hope, as I say, that will give you the sense of, of where we're going and some of the texts that I'll be citing, you'll find the references uh, there on the sheet. So my title is uh, The Poor You Have Always With You, and my question is why it mattered to the early church, why it mattered to the early church to give to the poor. In uh, Paul's account of the Jerusalem Conference, which took place in about 48 CE, he records an agreement between himself and Barnabas on the one hand as, as pioneers of the mission to Gentiles and the pillar apostles on the other hand as leaders in the Jewish mission. They agreed, he says, on mutual recognition between the two missions, but they also agreed, quote, that we remember the poor, which he says he was eager to do. Now, even if the phrase the poor here means specifically what he calls elsewhere, the poor among the saints in Jerusalem, the language he uses evokes a wider commitment to, to relieve poverty, which was central to the identity of the early Christian movement. Here is the phrase right at the heart of the most important meeting in early Christianity. To remember the poor was of course, to draw on a deep, rich, and, li and still living Jewish tradition, which was distinguished by its notion of God's special concern for the poor and the duty of almsgiving. Indeed, in this tradition, the term, the very term, the poor, had taken on a special religious character, alongside frequent special mention um, 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 of the widow and the orphan. Now, Jews were not alone in thinking that the wealthy should give benefits to those less well-off. The Greek and Roman habits of benefaction effectively elicited the gifts of wealthy benefactors for the good of their civic communities. But these benefactors gave benefits rarely, if ever, targeted at any particular socioeconomic group. The benefits were normally given to fellow citizens or fellow club members, irrespective of their economic condition. And the important difference in the, ancient, uh, in the cities of the ancient world was the difference between citizen and non-citizen, and not the difference between rich and poor. So even if both Greeks and Romans regularly tossed coins to beggars, which they did, and which was why beggars bothered to beg at all, Greeks and Romans did not think that society had a social obligation to support the needy in any general or systematic way. The early Christians inherited Jewish assumptions and Jewish biblical texts which did envisage a special concern for the poor as such. And it was in taking this tradition outside of the Jewish community into a wider public arena that Christians injected a new theme into the culture and practice of the Roman world. But there were also some distinctive Christian accents in the ways that Christians spoke about and practiced their charity to the poor, novel nuances and configurations that gave special significance to this theme. Indeed, the fact that Christians gave to the poor was to become a core feature of early Christian identity. And my task in this lecture tonight is to chart some of the ways that this took place and why it mattered to early Christians both to give to the poor and to talk repeatedly about doing so. I'm going to keep roughly to the first two centuries of the Christian movement, 
well aware of the rich scholarship on this topic in later centuries, and some of you may know a wonderful book by Peter Brown uh, called Through the Eye of the Needle, which is on a later Christian era, the um, fourth and fifth centuries. I hope to trace some of the ways that the charity of Christians became, as it were, specifically Christian charity. Though I'll have to be quite selective in drawing from a large pool of evidence. So my first heading is, as you'll see in the handout, a Christian ethos of hyper-generosity. Christians did not just give. They liked to think that they gave lavishly and recklessly to a degree and in forms that went beyond the normal expectations of benefaction or gift. Ancient society was formed by bonds and networks of benefit and gift and mutual support within families, among neighbors and friends, in civic communities, in the Roman Empire as a whole. But it was wise, of course, to give discriminately and thoughtfully, to give appropriately to suitable recipients who would themselves enter into a reciprocal exchange. There was very little point giving anything significant to the genuinely poor because they couldn't, of course, by definition, give you anything back. Which is why you'll remember in the parable of the, of the prodigal son, he was so poor and impoverished that it, the, the text says, and no one gave him anything. Not so among Christians. From the compilations of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels and right on through many strands of early Christian discourse, there's a notable emphasis on forms of giving which are uncalculating, unconditioned, reckless, and in this sense, hyper-generous. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, don't ask for them again. So says Jesus in the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6. Luke records those things in a notable compilation of, I think, self-consciously abnormal instructions. Paul, without referring to the teaching of Jesus, similarly urges believers to bless those who persecute you and not to return evil for evil. The Roman believers, he says, are to attend to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. From a very different stream of the Christian tradition, the text we know as the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, also demands an abnormal degree of self-giving. Give to everyone, it says, who asks, and do not ask for anything back. For the Father wants everyone to be given something from the gracious gifts that he himself provides. Different again in origin, but similar in moral tone, is a text we know as the Epistle to Diognetus from the second century, which parades the multiple paradoxes of Christian existence. Christians love everyone, it says, and are persecuted by all. They are reviled, but they bless. They are mistreated, but they bestow honor. They do good, and they're punished as evil. In different ways and in very different social and cultural contexts, these texts all figure the Christian ethos as one of exceptional and counterintuitive generosity. Both in giving and in refusing to retaliate, Christians flouted the norms of the ordinary discriminating gift and the ordinary calculated reciprocity. Now a number of, it's very interesting that a number of second century Christian apologies, texts written for outsiders, make this Christian self-image a feature in the way they recommend themselves to others. Justin Martyr highlights the ways that hostilities are overcome both within the church and in its, and the church's relations with outsiders, while Aristides' apology describes in some detail the lengths to which Christians go in supporting one another. Their love of one another, he says, embraces widows and orphans, while he who, ha he who has gives to him who has not without boasting. When one of their poor people dies, he says, the Christian poor people dies, they club together to fund his burial. Very, very important service in the ancient world. 
And if they hear that one of their number is imprisoned or afflicted on account of the name of their Messiah, all of them anxiously minister to his need. And if it's possible to redeem him, they set him free. And if there's any among them who is poor or needy, and this, uh, get this, this is interesting, if they have no spare food, they fast for two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. What Aristides is describing here is not the top-down patronage from the rich, but an exceptional degree of communal sharing among those who don't have many resources themselves. They have to fast to save food for others. Such a scenario is recounted here to impress outsiders as displaying an unusual quality and depth of communal generosity. In other texts from the second century, it emerges that many churches developed a central repository of money under the care of a church leader. And Tertullian's apology makes much of the fact that this common chest of money built up by small, freely given gifts month by month are used, he says, not for the support of merrymaking, for drinking and gormandizing, but for feeding the poor and burying the dead and providing for girls and boys who have neither parents nor provisions left to support them, for relieving old people worn out in the service of the saints or those who've suffered shipwreck or are condemned to the mines or islands or prisons purely for the sake of Christ. Tertullian could clearly bank on gaining some respect for this Christian charitable activity, but he thinks it would sound remarkable that the Christian community is not a self-help and self-financing dinner club, but devotes its money to the good of those who are genuinely in need. In other words, Christians believe they were, and like to tell others that they were, a community imbued with an ethos of exceptional generosity. Now, we might be inclined to think this is all just the Christians bigging themselves up as reckless and hyper-generous givers, but interestingly, we have evidence that this image is not entirely false because we have an image of the Christians given by a hostile outsider, Lucian, who at the end of the second century describes a person he regards as a complete fraud called, um, um, called Peregrinus, who he says professed to be a Christian and lived off Christian generosity, being supported both in and outside of, um, in, uh, in and outside of, um, of, um, 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 of, um, of, of his prison. Lucian thinks that this character was typical of, of many. So he says, if any charlatan or trickster comes among the Christians, he quickly acquires sudden wealth by imposing upon such simple people. In fact, interestingly, Christians were themselves very aware of the dangers inherent in their own hypergenerosity. And we find in our Christian sources a number of efforts to safeguard their tendency to indiscriminate generosity from being abused. In the very chapter in Didache, where believers are instructed to give to everyone who asks, there are also strong warnings against people who receive handouts when they're not really in need. The one, it says, who, re who receives without a need will have to testify, I think he means before God, as to why he received what he did and for what purpose. And that chapter ends with what was, I think, originally a non-Christian saying, but here adopted as Christian wisdom. Here's, here's, here's the little saying, let your gift to charity sweat in your hands until you know to whom to give it. If it sweats in your hand, you're clutching onto it tight, you hold it tight with clenched fists for quite a time in the Mediterranean heat, or in Texan heat, uh, while you work out whether the prospective recipient really needs or deserves it. Precisely the kind of calculation that the ethos of reckless Christian generosity tended to disregard. So you see a tension here in Christianity. Give, give to everyone who begs. Well, should you be a little bit careful discriminating who you give to, or should you just give without questions asked? A tension here between an impetus to override the normal caution that accompanies benefaction in antiquity and a kind of Christian prudence that is wary of being taken for a ride. If you read on 
in, uh, in, in, uh, if you read on in the Didache to the, to the final chapters, chapters 11 to 13, you find a fascinating concrete illustration of that tension. Believers are told to give hospitality to traveling prophets. But they're also warned very clearly that if these newcomers stay more than two days, or if they demand in the spirit, in the spirit to be given a meal, then you know they are clearly false prophets and should be shown out of town. It's very good advice for when you've got somebody, a guest who's overstaying, they're, they're welcome. Just turn to the book of Didache and you'll find there what to say. You've been here two days and it's time to move on. Didache clearly comes from a context where Christian travelers could arrive without introduction to exploit an, uncritical, uh, to exploit an ethic of uncritical hospitality and where indeed conversions to Christianity could be motivated by desire to access Christian resources, and where it was hard to tell the difference between a Christian teacher who is worthy of support and what the text calls a Christ merchant, who was happy to sponge off the community for as long as he could. Now, Christian anxieties on this matter about their own, as it were, generosity go back all the way to 2 Thessalonians, which has strict instructions to, to idlers to get to work and support themselves, and to 1 Timothy 5, where the support of widows is rigorously circumscribed and the church refuses to fund any who are less than 60 years old and who have alternative means of support. That's the flip side to the Christian claim to succor the orphans and the widows, it happened, but it was easy for this generous policy to lead to an unsustained demand. Both the Shepherd of Hermas, um, 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 uh, a text from Rome from the second century, and Clement of Alexandria at the end of the second century, beginning of the third, both display agonized Christian debates about how indiscriminately believers should give. Hermas is told by uh, uh, it's, uh, 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 is told by the shepherd to take what you've earned through the labors that God has given you and to give simply to those in need, not wavering about to whom you should give something and to whom not. It's the recipients who'll give an account to God if they were in real hardship, fair enough. If they receive something out of, uh, out of, of hypocrisy, they'll pay a penalty. The shepherd's emphasis on simplicity is characteristic of this whole work, and one can see here an effort to encourage what might seem foolish generosity by placing the blame for a poorly directed gift entirely on the recipient. Clement of Alexandria makes a, a similar point. Don't try to decide who is worthy of your gift and who is not, he tells the rich, since it's easy to make a mistake in this matter and incur God's judgment. Do not judge that you may not be judged. Best to give freely to all in need, since there will be someone worthy among them. So even Clement, who otherwise stays so close to the standard assumptions of the rich in the ancient world, encourages a kind of recklessness. The sort of recklessness that Lucian would deride, but that reflected the predominant ethos of the early Christian movement. It mattered to the early church to give to the poor, even if in the process they gave sometimes to charlatans and to the undeserving, because this quality of giving matched their self-image as driven by a hyper-generous ethic. Secondly, let's have a look at charity in the early church as the relief of what I think was a deep ambivalence towards wealth. Now, large disparities of wealth create social tensions wherever they exist, especially within close-knit communities where they're glaringly obvious. In the Greek and Roman world, such tensions were diffused by the conspicuous generosity of the wealthy towards their own cities. The benefactions of grain or festivals or buildings, games, bathhouses and so on that we see very gratefully acknowledged and commemorated throughout the Roman Empire. Philosophically, the tension created by wealth disparities could be resolved by discounting wealth as a merely external good and not a good at all, only what the Stoics would call an adiaphron, something neither here nor there, which might be advantageous but was not at all essential. The true good, virtue, the Stoics said, was at home as much in a poor man's cottage 
as in a rich man's mansion, or at least so the super-rich Seneca likes to say. Jews of the Second Temple era used both of these moves, both social benefaction and philosophical redescription of wealth, to relieve the tensions created by wealth. Witness the, witness the Jewish philosopher Philo and his fabulously wealthy brother, Alexander, who made large donations to the temple. But there was also, uh, there um, uh, within the Jewish tradition, a wisdom tradition which interpreted wealth as the blessing of God and therefore nothing for the rich to be embarrassed about. Although the early Christians used many of these traditions to justify the presence of wealthy believers in their midst, their attempts to relieve the tensions created by wealth were made harder by certain features of the Christian tradition that made wealth a very problematic phenomenon. In the first place, there were, of course, traditions about Jesus, including his very outspoken critique of wealth and the wealthy. Woe to you who are rich. That made uncomfortable hearing for wealthier members of the churches. Jesus' instruction to the rich young man to sell all that he had and to give the proceeds to the poor combined with his saying that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, these are, obviously, uh, these are obvious cases in point. And we can watch the extremely wealthy Clement of Alexandria struggle mightily with these texts in his treatise called Who is the Rich Man Who is to be Saved? But in and beyond Jesus' sayings, there is also a deep early Christian suspicion of wealth as a phenomenon belonging to this world, which not only has nothing to do with the wealth of the world to come, but is liable to impede and undermine Christian discipleship. This kind of eschatological disparagement of wealth created a deep Christian anxiety that money or possessions represented an investment in this age a form of capital that stood in tension in contrast to the true symbolic capital of treasure in heaven. The apocalyptic dualisms of early Christianity, which were such a significant feature of its discourse, lend themselves to this suspicion of material wealth, a suspicion that was fed by the fact that wealthy Christians often appeared to live on the edge of Christian communities and were quick to abandon the faith when it became socially and materially costly to associate with the church. Now, if you look at the comments on the wealthy in 1 Timothy 6, you see good evidence of this phenomenon. Instructions are here given to those who are rich in the present age, an age contrasted with the future, which is where they should store what really counts as treasure. Wealth is not only inessential, as the text says, if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with these. It's not only temporary, we brought nothing into the world and we'll take nothing out of it. It also constitutes a kind of erroneous form of investment, one which counts for nothing in a Christian eschatological perspective. The true investment is to set one's hopes on God. Wealth is thus a dangerous distraction associated not only with the normal vices of wealth, widely recognized in the Greek and Roman world. Everybody criticizes the wealthy for being proud, self-indulgent, luxurious, obsessed with greed. But it also represents in Christian discourse a tendency to, as it's put here in 1 Timothy 6, to wander away from the faith. The rich may be tolerated in the church only so long as they are rich in good deeds, that is, generous towards others. But if they do not share they, their wealth in these ways, it's clear they've not grasped hold of what the text calls the life that is really life. That is the life of the future age. Now, this same dualism between this age and the age to come is expressed in even starker terms and pervades the first parable or similitude in this wonderful text called the Shepherd of Hermas. <clears throat> Here, the slaves of God are reminded that they're living this present life in a foreign land. 
in a city governed by a lord whose rules do not correspond to the civic laws of their true home in heaven. This vivid met metaphor is, is, then developed, um, is then developed further. If you invest here, the text asks, what will you do when you're forced to make a choice for one jurisdiction or another? Will you completely renounce your own Christian law for the sake of these fields and whatever ever else you own and follow the law of the city you are now in? Here again, it's clear that the danger of apostasy is acute. The likelihood that the wealthy will apostatize when the heat comes on. And that, as the author says with what seems to me almost British understatement, will not be to your advantage. <laughs> the two cities with their two lords and two laws stand in opposition. You may invest in one, or in the other, but not in both. Buying and equipping properties in this world, that is, at least buying and equipping anything above what it calls absolutely necessary, is an indication that your investments are, in placed, are placed in entirely the wrong portfolio. Now, this is where giving to the poor becomes such an important phenomenon, because the early Christians figured, thought about charity as a form of investment in the world to come. The tension surrounding wealth could be relieved and suspicions dispelled if wealth was manifestly deployed in giving to the poor. As the first parable in the Shepherd of Hermas continues, instead of fields, you should purchase souls that have been afflicted, insofar as you can, that is, take care of widows and orphans and do not neglect them. Spend your wealth and all your furnishings for such fields and houses which you have received from God. It's much better to purchase the fields, goods, and houses you find in your own city when you return to it. So you get the image. Don't, don't buy that piece of property here. Give to the poor, and you're, in effect, buying a piece of future heavenly property. You're investing in the future. The property you purchase in your heavenly homeland are the poor whom you benefit. Generosity for the poor is thus for the rich person an infinitely better investment. It's risk-free, guilt-edged, and high return. Christian giving is thus the safety valve, as it were, that allows an otherwise dubious and dangerous accumulation of wealth to remain tolerable, that is, by being released in charity to fellow believers. Now, this notion is memorably pictured in, in the next parable in the Shepherd of Hermas as the symbiotic relationship between the elm and the vine, which are used as figures for the rich and the poor. It was a well-known custom in the ancient world uh, in, in, in the way that you um, grow vines, that you train them up young elm saplings, young elm trees, which were carefully cropped to provide short and sturdy support for the vine to attach itself to. And at the same time, the elm's deep roots kept moisture in the ground for when the weather was dangerously dry. I think you can still see that uh, uh, in the Middle East today. The shepherd uh, pictures the coexistence of the rich and the poor as akin to this agricultural symbiosis. The rich support the, the poor by their material provision, enabling the vine, that's the poor, to bear more and better fruit, which isn't trailing on the ground and getting rotten. In fact, the fruit may even be credited to the rich themselves. The fruit is the prayer and the piety of the poor. Here's a quote. For the poor person is rich in his petition and thanksgiving, and his petition has a great effect before God. And so the rich person supplies everything to the one who is poor without hesitation. And then the poor person, having his needs supplied by the one who is rich, prays to God and thanks God for the one who has given him what he needs. And the rich person becomes even more eager to help out the poor person so that he may lack nothing in this life. For he knows that the petition of the poor person is acceptable and rich before the Lord. And so both accomplish their work. 
The author of this text trades on the assumption that the poor have a deeper and richer piety in their relationship to God. That notion has biblical roots, but it's also perhaps corresponded to, the, to, to sociological fact. The poverty of the poor made their existence constantly precarious, so they were far more likely to pray repeatedly and earnestly for the satisfaction of their material and physical needs. They were also likely to be more assiduous in their attachment to the church because their needs were liable to be met by the charitable giving of fellow believers. In this parable, the piety of the poor makes up for the spiritual poverty of the rich, whose prayers are said elsewhere in this text, the prayers of the rich are weak and small and of little effect. So the arrangement, as you can see, is clearly a win-win situation. The poor benefit materially and the rich benefit spiritually. On a cynical view, the rich are here excused for their shallow spirituality and perhaps their tenuous relationship to the church so long as they give generously to support the poor in the congregation. In this way, their wealth is justified so long as it's shared and the social and theological tension created by their wealth is usefully diffused. We might criticize this symbiotic social configuration as pandering to the self-interest of the rich. We might ask, should they not give altruistically to the poor without the incentive of reward or return? But we should be a little careful here. It is we who have created a peculiarly modern antithesis between self-interest and disinterest, whereas in the ancient world it was entirely reasonable to see one's own interests as embedded in or linked to the interests of others. After all, even Jesus motivated giving secretly on the grounds that the father who sees in secret will reward the generous giver. What's significant and striking is the way in which the shepherd of Hermas gives the, benefic the benefaction of the wealthy in the church a specifically Christian tenor and accepts the presence of the wealthy in the church uh, uh, accepts the presence of the wealthy in the church as congruent with its own apocalyptic ethos. It was not at all uncommon in the ancient world for the wealthy to be benefactors of their communities, and in one sense what our texts do is merely replicate that arrangement within the Christian church. But by presenting this benefaction as an investment in a heavenly future, by figuring giving to the poor as the purchase of property in heaven, a language is found that preserves Christian difference, even while sanctioning what might seem a relatively common practice. In other words, Christian giving feels different and sounds different from the normal benefactions of its social surroundings by being figured as the acquisition of investments in another city. Rich Christians can consider themselves to be investing in another world while donating their resources to the material this worldly maintenance of the poor. In such ways, charitable giving turns the wealth of Christians into Christian wealth, reconfigured as appropriate wealth if utilized in this way. Clement of Alexandria, in the text I've mentioned before, spends many chapters refuting a literal reading of Jesus' instruction to the rich man. Clement can't accept that Jesus really meant, the rich man was meant to sell his possessions. He says that would be a crude and fleshly interpretation. Uh, he then, but he then makes a move similar to that of the shepherd of Hermas through invoking Jesus' command to make friends by means of unrighteous mammon so that your friends may welcome you into the eternal home. This is Luke 16. Well, mammon is unrighteous, he insists, only if it is used purely for oneself. If it's given to the poor, wealth suddenly becomes useful. And here it helps if you know a bit of Greek because he plays on words. The kremeter, he says, become kresima. The money becomes useful. Useful because it's prepared by God for the use of human beings. Far from being evil or corrupting, possessions, even luxury goods, are now figured as gifts from God. To quote Clement, he who holds possessions and gold and silver and houses as gifts of God and from them ministers to the salvation of men for God the giver and knows that he possesses them for his brother's sake rather than his own and lives superior to the possession of them, 
This is the man who is blessed by the Lord and called poor in spirit. He likes the Matthean version of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Strangely enough, he doesn't ever quote Jesus' woe to the rich. It's noticeable that even in the first parable of the shepherd of Hermas, where material possessions are generally configured as investments in an alien city, as soon as there is talk of giving to the poor, the perception of wealth is altered. To quote, this is why the master, that's God, made you rich, that you may carry out these ministries for him. So this wealth becomes now reconfigured as God-given riches supplied by God for a positive purpose and use. The second parable finishes with a notable blessing on the rich. Blessed are those who have possessions and understand that their riches have come from the Lord. For the one who understands this will be able to perform a good ministry. Reconfigured as wealth given by God and deployed as wealth given in a ministry to the poor, the wealth of Christians becomes a truly Christian wealth. And the deep ambivalence towards wealth that characterizes so much of the early Christian tradition reaches a moderately stable resolution. Thirdly, let's think about giving to the poor as the expression of a theology of gift. As we've just seen, it was possible to configure wealth not just as a danger and an obstacle to piety, but as a gift from God. On this basis, it was possible, indeed attractive, to configure the giver as an imitator of God, or even as a conduit through which God's gifts are passed on to other human recipients. It's this conceptual framework that the second parable in the Shepherd of Hermas invokes in blessing the rich who understand that their riches have come from the Lord. In the same way as we've seen, Didache encourages Christians to give to those who ask, for, he says, the Father wants everyone to be given something from his own gracious gifts. The notion that believers might be generous like God, is of course embedded deep in the, in the Lucan Sermon on the Plain. To love your enemies is to be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. For the author of the epistle to Diognetus, the notion of imitation of God is absolutely explicit. When you have loved God, you will be an imitator of God's kindness. For whoever takes up the burden of his neighbor, whoever wants to use his own abundance to help someone in need, whoever provides for the destitute from the possessions he has himself received from God, becomes himself God to the recipients. He is an imitator of God. Now the notion that one should imitate God or the gods in one's giving is familiar in Stoicism in the Roman world. It's not, it's not a distinctively Jewish or Christian notion. And we find Seneca, for instance, in his great treatise on benefactions referring to the many unceasing gifts of the gods, which are the gifts of nature, given even to the grateful and the unworthy. Seneca cites these as reasons why the virtuous giver should not cease to give, since the gods give rain and sunshine to worthy and unworthy alike. What marks Christian discourse out in this respect is not so much the notion of imitating God, but the notion that in giving to others, we are passing on the, the gifts given to us in a kind of secondary step of benefaction, or indeed as the expression of divine gift. There's a very famous uh, little notice about the makeup of the church, of the early church which, um, which uh, 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 in Rome in the second century, which um, the church historian Eusebius records, um, which goes like this. There were 46 presbyters, seven deacons, seven subdeacons, 42 acolytes, 52 exorcists, readers and doorkeepers, and over 1,500 widows and persons in distress, all of whom are supported by the grace and loving kindness of the master. Note that final phrase. All of whom are supported by the grace and loving kindness of the master. That's Christ. So all this material support is here notably attributed to Christ. The notice passes over in silence the human benefactors who paid in, into the church coffers. It's as if the human givers were merely agents of divine gifts and the whole church is directly dependent on the divine benefactor. 
Now, the first and perhaps the most profound theologian of human giving as an expression and conduit of divine gift is the Apostle Paul, whose configuration of the Jerusalem collection in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 stands as a foundational statement on the topic of grace. At every step, Paul frames the money that he's trying to elicit from the Corinthians as an expression and manifestation of the divine gift. In starting with the example of the Macedonians, we expect him to begin with, I don't want you to be ignorant, my brothers and sisters, of the generosity of the Macedonians. Instead, he writes, I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, of the grace of God given to the Macedonians. On that basis, he explains how the Macedonians gave so richly out of their considerable poverty. The grace, the charis, that is the main topic of these two chapters, is simultaneously the grace of God in Christ and the grace gift that the Corinthians will give to Jerusalem. That gift connected to the grace of God, not by some artificial linguistic trick, but because it is, there is a deep inner connection. One of the striking things about this passage is that the gift of Corinth or Achaia is traced not so much, or at least not only, to the gifts of God in nature, but specifically to the gift of God in Christ. The most important warrant and source of gift is not so much creation, but the Christ gift, the topic of Paul's final outburst, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. The heart of these chapters is the Christological gift For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that because he was rich, he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Now, in that story, that little narrative there, there's no transfer of riches in a material sense. You might think of the gifts of nature being gathered by the rich and then passed on in material terms to the poor, but in the pattern Paul is speaking about, it's not that Christ brings material gifts to earth, but rather a dynamic of generosity, a spirit of giving, if you like, an ethos, an attitude towards the world, the self and others, that transformed the lives and thus the material practices of those who participated in the Christ gift. In Christ, people become rich, not in material terms, but in the wealth, the only wealth that counts, the wealth of generosity, which cascades from Christ into the lives of believers and on from them in patterns of mutual material generosity. Now, one of the strengths of thinking about Christ's gift in this way is that everybody, however wealthy or poor they are, could think of themselves as participating in the dynamic of the gift of God in Christ. The Macedonians could participate in this gift momentum out of their deep poverty, just as the Corinthians could participate out of their comparative prosperity. In some, in some of the texts we've been looking at this evening, the discourse about the rich seems to be speaking of the super-rich, whose material gifts to the poor come down, as it were, from a very great height and preclude any reciprocity except in the prayers of the poor. But in other texts, the practical everyday actions of hospitality and washing the feet of the saints are acts readily accessible to almost all believers, even if they live very close to subsistence level themselves. In other words, the genius of early Christian talking about gift and sharing in in the gift of Christ, the momentum of the gift of Christ to the world, the genius of it is everybody can be part of this momentum. You don't have to be really wealthy to be part of it. What was important to the early Christians was that they all, from the richest to those absolutely on the bread line, could participate in a grace momentum that was distinctively Christian because it derived from Christ, and thus could know that their work in supporting those in need was integral to their identity as Christians. Whether they were wealthy and donated money and hardly even noticed that they'd done so, or whether they were poor and fasted for two days to save enough food for those who had none, believers could share in the gift of God to the world in Christ, and so could connect their identity as Christians to their practices at this very deep level. Giving, in other words, was a way of being in Christ, 
and so a crucial way of being themselves. With us, what I've tried to do is trace here three ways in which giving to the poor was important for the early church. It was a way of expressing an unusual and self-conscious ethos of hyper-generosity. It helped relieve the tension caused by the presence of worldly wealth in a church that was meant to be focused primarily on the world to come. And it connected believers at the deepest level to the generosity of God and especially to the generosity of God in Christ. Now, scholars who write on this subject are are apt to speak of the utility of the poor, that is, the convenience the poor people provided for the rich as an outlet for their wealth, and thus as a kind of subtle justification for the riches that they only partly dispersed. One can certainly gain that impression from reading Clement of Alexandria, who seems delighted to find that he can disregard the literal meaning of the Gospels on the condition that rich believers used at least some of their wealth to bring some benefit to the poor. But Clement speaks of the poor with such high-minded disdain that one gets the impression that he knows the poor only from a very great distance. But there are others, other early Christians who seem much closer to the realities of poverty. Authors who know, for instance, like the author of The Shepherd of Hermas, that the truly impoverished are quite likely to be driven to suicide and for whom supporting the poor is less a salve to their consciences than a moral imperative born of genuine concern. To say that giving to the poor served the functions that I have sketched in this lecture is not to say that it served merely a utilitarian purpose. My aim has been to show just how and why it became so central to the Christian way of life and thought. Extreme poverty was a ubiquitous fact of life in antiquity as it is in the world today. But then, as today, the rich showed a remarkable capacity to ignore this fact, to block out the presence of the poor, and to focus only on their own interests and concerns. The early Christians, however, did not ignore poverty, but took its reality into the very heart of their churches and the, and the alleviation of poverty into the very core of their practices. To a remarkable extent, the poor lived among them in their rhetoric and in their practice. To remember the poor was not then a passing early phase. This memory worried early Christians, unsettled them, and inspired them to sometimes heroic feats of generosity. Because in giving to the poor, they found that they became at many levels most fully Christian, most truly themselves. Thanks very much for listening. We have time here for a a few questions. Uh, If you'd raise your hand and then wait till I give you the microphone so everyone can hear, that'd be great. Thanks. Is that a hand I see over here? Yeah. Okay, I was just curious. What made you interested in this topic? What made you want to study this? Um, That's, uh, 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 I could give many kinds of answers. Let me give the simplest, uh, most autobiographical answer. at the age of 18, I spent nine months in, uh, I spent nine months in, um, 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 in India and Pakistan. And uh, I worked in a church there in Lahore in Pakistan. And I um, walked past a lot of beggars on the streets every day. And I kind of got used to it after a while. And then all of a sudden, it slapped me in the eyes. Uh, and I had the biggest problem, the biggest culture shock, uh, coming home to the UK and thinking, my word, this is obscene. Um, so I guess at an autobiographical level, that's what, that's what got me into, into this topic, and the experience of, of the world. Uh, yeah, I'll, fin- I'll <laughs> thank you. Yeah.
Toward the end of the lecture, you mentioned uh, the passage where Jesus was made poor, that we might become rich. Yes. And you pointed out that um, he, he didn't bring material things for us, but yes. he, so that we might become spiritually rich. So my question is, how was he made poor? Because I can't imagine that he was spiritually poor. Um, no. Um... Uh, it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a um, financial metaphor for the incarnation. Uh, obviously, the closest parallel is 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 the, is the Philippians two passage about becoming human. Um, uh, it's normally that passage is normally translated. Although he was rich, he became poor. Um, I actually think it's better translated because he was rich, he became poor. Because his riches are his generosity. God's greatest wealth is not some that God has some sort of super store of, <laughs> of, of, of uh, God's greatest wealth is God's, is God's giving of God's self. And, and that's all the way through that, that passage, Paul, Paul uses that double sense of, of wealth. Um, and so Christ's, Christ's wealth is in, as in, 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 in humbling himself, in becoming poor. Uh, in that sense of of emptying of uh, emptying himself of of his divine prerogatives, if you like, uh, um, um, uh, but it's, you know, it seems to me important that it's not material things because it's not a question of well your pockets are now full of cash so you can give some out because that would mean certain people could enter into the momentum of grace and other people couldn't because they've got nothing in their pockets and the whole point is the Macedonians were given out of nothing they had very very little so this fascination with the ability of the very very poor still to be generous givers you know the story of the of the of the widow's might and so on is I think deep very deeply ingrained in early Christianity and is very powerful because it means everybody can be part of the same momentum thanks Thank you, Dr. Buckley, for your lecture. I very much enjoyed that. Uh, I just had one question. It's more of a pastoral kind of question, yes. but uh, what kind of advice would you give to the American church in terms of uh, giving to the poor and, and more specifically, like, um, I guess, people standing on, on street corners, that kind of thing, yep. Yep. Uh, just to get perspective uh, kind of from the outside looking in, if that makes sense? Um. Well, far be it from me to, to uh, uh, speak to the, um, I, it's the same, I don't see any fundamental difference between the issues, you know, that we have in the, in the UK, where there's plenty of homeless people on the streets uh, as well there, and yeah, I mean, we feel exactly the same tensions the early Christians felt, it, I fascinated to come across all this material, should you give or should you only, you know, should you not give to it, should you give indiscriminately or should you not, should you be quite cautious who you give to, and you can see that tension in early Christianity on that. Um, I mean, I think uh, more fundamentally, um, and I find this you know, great challenge to myself, what, what matters in early Christianity is that this momentum of generosity is such that you give to the point where you are the yourself um, vulnerable. You know, that, uh, uh, that, 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 that you're giving to the point where you have to depend on God. Uh, um, and um, uh, there's, a, there's someone I know in the, in the UK who decided uh, uh, Christian discipleship meant living on, on the minimum wage. Uh, we have a, a minimum wage in, in the UK, uh, which is £7.83, I think, an hour. And said, well, she was, on a, she was a university lecturer. She said, well, I think Christian discipleship means I should give away everything above the minimum wage. And uh, I'm mighty impressed by that. Uh, but uh, I think, um, I mean, there's a great tradition of generosity in, 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 in the churches here. Um, and I think America has a lot to teach, American churches have a lot to teach the rest of the, of the world on that. Um, we, we still, I think, you know, live at a level of, of affluence that when you compare this on the world scene, we live at a level of affluence and needless expense and you know, needless luxury, which is just mind-boggling you know, to most Christians, 
who make the majority church uh, uh, in other, other parts of the world. And I say we, because this is not just you, but... Yeah. Dr. Barkley, I was wondering um, a little bit about the uh, early church context and where you see um, slaves kind of fitting into this picture. Ah, right. um, to what extent were uh, church members able to support them and to what extent were they able to participate in this kind of generosity that you're talking about? Oh, that's interesting. Um, you mean to what extent slaves could participate in this? Yes, yeah. Um, well, slaves... Uh, it's very hard to generalize about slaves because there are many different kinds of slave. And there's the, if you're the slave of a wealthy person in a, and you are the, yourself in a very highly treasured role, like a doctor or a teacher in a big household, you might actually be not, not very poor. You might, to be a slave is not necessarily to be poor. It depends on the environment in which you're working and, and whether you have, as I say, a wealthy owner. Uh, slaves did have um, uh, uh, the ability to have little bits of, of money, sometimes uh, um, uh, reasonable amounts of money. We find slaves who paradoxically own other slaves. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that slaves are the lowest of the low in the ancient world. It's a much more complex picture than that. Um, um, and in interestingly, you know, the instructions to give and so on are not... Uh, and not specific. Well, of course, I'm only applying. I'm only saying this to those who are free, and it doesn't apply to slaves. So I think we could imagine uh, those little um, poor boxes, as it were, in the in the in the churches of the early church. There's the central chests where they gathered money. I think we can imagine, as Paul already says to the Corinthians, you know, you give as you as much as you can. Uh, there's no set amount, um, but you give uh, as as you can. And that could be very, very, very small amounts from people who had very little, but they're still part of this community of, of giving. Um, on the other side, you find an interesting question arising is whether you should use that chest of money in the church to buy people out of slavery. There's examples of that taking place, examples of criticism of that as well in early Christianity. But that was an option to use the church money to buy people out of slavery by paying the ransom fee to, to, to the owner. That's an interesting phenomenon too. Um, so it is, it's bound up with the system of slavery, but not, it doesn't quite match onto it exactly, the wealth and, and poor. But that's a good, very good question, thank you. Thank you, Professor Barclay. Great, my question is, again, another historical one. Uh, a lot of the examples you give are about giving to people who seem to be or would claim to be members of the community. Yes, yeah. The, so the obvious question then is, what about people who aren't members right. of the community? Is this a direct analogy with giving between citizens of a city, mm. or is this really quite different? That's very interesting. Yes, uh, uh, it's interesting that you know, Tertullian and others are mostly talking, it seems mostly talking about giving within the church. Um, but... Um, there is evidence that this did extend wider than the church, and you know, the most famous evidence of that is the Emperor Julian, uh, Julian the Apostate, uh, in the three, Emperor 361 to 363, uh, um, who wrote a famous letter complaining about the Christians. Julian was brought up as a Christian, then he became a pagan, and um, was very critical of Christians. But he wrote a famous letter complaining that Christians give not only to their own poor, but to our poor as well. And he says, it's about time, why don't we do that? Why don't we pagans do that? You know? uh, uh, so that's, that's uh, th that, that, that he as a former Christian, but now pagan, recognizes that the boundaries of the church are not the limits of Christian charity is very interesting. And I think, um, I mean, you might wonder whether some people became Christians in order to benefit from this, uh, from the charitable systems in the church, but it seems that they weren't entirely limited to uh, church circles themselves. And, and uh, you know, um, Roman historians like Ramsey McMullen and, and Robin Lane Fox and others have argued that this is one of the, possibly one of the most important ways in which the church 
gained, as it were, popularity in, in the ancient world is because it was known that they were a community whose generosity could leak outside of their, of their own uh, boundaries. Um, do you think that even today being extremely generous is a way of being a true Christian? Being mm -hmm. that, I mean, if you are very generous, usually, um, I guess the news puts you on the media and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we usually, well, in the Bible it says that you're not truly righteous if, you know, if it's seen by others, but right. if it's just seen by God or done right. in secret. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I absolutely think, that if there's one thing that churches should be known for, it is their, their generosity. I mean, the, you know, the central hallmark of the church seems to me, to me, it should be, it should be, it's generosity. Um, but that can often happen in very um, non-public ways. Uh, um, um, uh, I think, I mean, that's of the people you know, that I know, some of the most uh, generous, no, they're never going to be recognized by, you know, then it's never going to be famous, partly because then what they're giving is actually not very much in, in, you know, compared to the Bill Gateses of this world is absolutely, in, totally insignificant, but it's very sacrificial. Uh, and that's, I think that's what, what 2 Corinthians 8 is saying, it's not the amount you give, because otherwise there'd be some Christians better than others because they just happen to be richer. It's how you give. And it's the spirit in which you give and the costliness with which you give. And, you know, I mean, to go back to my experience in Pakistan, unbelievable generosity and hospitality from people who had, you know, by Western standards, absolutely nothing. And yet they were sharing and in a, in a costly way uh, to themselves uh, to a level that would just totally shame any, any normal Western Christian. So I think it's that sort of unseen and unsung uh, generosity that is really what what these texts are talking about rather than the high profile p public events yeah. okay, somebody, I see that the eager Thank you. Um, so it's a common belief in Christian faith that God calls people to serve him through different paths and different mediums and whatnot. And while all are called to be charitable, do you think that God could call people to use their wealth for other means than giving to the poor? Like you have these yeah. Christians that are called to give everything to the poor and become poor, become mm. a hermit. Do you think that God can call people to use their wealth in other mediums? Um, Yes, it seems to me the, the, the critical criterion is um, that your wealth, the, the reconfiguring what you have as, as in the service of others. Now, that can be in the service of others in many different ways. Um, but reconfiguring what you have as in trust from God for other people rather than your own. In other words, it's like a library book. You borrowed it, but it's not actually yours, but you use it. So it's, it's at your use, but it's not your, your possession. Uh, and, and, and that means it frees it up to be used for others. And that can take place in a large number of different ways. Um, and uh, so um, there have always been you know, particular striking instances in, early Christian, uh, in, in, in Christian history, right from early Christianity, of people um, who who followed the you know Jesus's command to the rich young ruler to give away everything? Um, um, I don't think that's necessarily, as it were, a um, that 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 form of generosity is not necessarily the rule for everybody. But the generosity that is required is not just a kind of well, of course, I'll be a little bit distant from it. I won't I won't accumulate. It, it's more the sense of everything I have is open is open palmed, as it were, and 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 is, is on an open palm and 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 is available for others. Um, and that and then the particular expression of that can be very different for different for different people, different circumstances. For the sake of time, let this be the last question here. So, uh, as the uh, 
roving Mike person, I get to give it to one of my pastors. So, uh. <laughs> I guess this is a, a historical question. Um, from our context, uh, one of the issues facing you know, Mercy Ministries now is the issue of toxic charity or yes. when helping hurts, you know, to yes. name two books. Is there any history yeah. of that being an issue in a conversation in the early hmm. church? Um, I don't know that. I, I don't know that book, but I'm just looking out for that. Uh, um, I think one of the really fascinating things about Paul's uh, theology of giving is that it's not a one-way gift. Uh, what his model of a community is the model of the body in which every part has something to give to the other. Uh, even fascinatingly, even when he says to the, to, to the Corinthians, I want you to give to Jerusalem, it's so that your excess might reach their need. And then he says, so that in time their excess might meet your need. And I'm sure the Corinthians thought, well, how on earth is that going to happen? Uh, but the, the fact that he insists on that is to ensure that this is not the patronizing one-way gift in which the all-powerful uh, 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 ser serve the needs of others and never become vulnerable themselves, but rather a, a, a truly vulnerable kind of giving in which there will be reciprocity, in which there will be a return of one sort or another, and in which we, we genuinely need each other. And I think, I, I, I don't know what's behind that phrase, toxic giving, but I suspect part of it is to do with the ways in which giving actually disables, humiliates, uh, uh, um, uh, disempowers the recipient. And Paul's image of giving is one where, where, uh, where the mutuality uh, en enables everybody to have the dignity of a giver and everybody to be in the position of, of the vulnerability of needing gift. I think... I find um, some of the some of the best, you know, some of the some of the people who give most find it very hard also to receive. But I think that is actually built into the the DNA of the Christian notion of community, um, the sense of of the vulnerability and the delight in in receiving, as well as giving, because it's a sign of the dignity of accord, affording according dignity to the other to be the dignity of of of, of the giver. Um, now that can work out in the political sphere and the social sphere in lots of ways, but it seems to me, you know, as 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 the letter to the Ephesians says, you know, I want you to work so that you can give, uh, to have to have the resources so that you can you 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 can give to to others, and and that's said to everybody. Yeah. All right. Well, if you'll uh, join me with uh, thanking Dr. Barclay.